Our Father in heaven, you are an incredible God that we really don't even understand. There's a whole lot about you that you've revealed to us in your word, and yet we know that that only scratches the surface. We know there is far more to know about you. There is far more to experience of you. And yet what we've experienced here in this time, on this earth, in our relationship with you, has been wonderful. And so we know that what's to come in heaven will be far more wonderful because we won't see through a mirror or through a glass dimly. We will see fully. We'll see with eyes wide open, unhindered by the sin that plagues us, the the disease that affects us, the sadness that grips us. We will worship you, wholly committed to you because of what you've done for us in Jesus by washing our sins away. Father, help us as we look into your word this morning from our homes, on our phones or tablets or TVs, with our family. Help us to learn how we might love you more, how we might declare your great character and your love that you have displayed to us and others, to a watching world that needs you. And be glorified in our midst, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we're in the Psalms, and the Psalms are are wonderful because they, they, they teach us how to pray. Uh, the Psalms are God's words given to us to pray back to Him. And, uh, you know, they have a particular God word direction. There are times that uh, I've grown so much from reading other saints who've gone before me in the faith and, and learning from them as they've written wonderful truths about God. Now, nothing comes close to God's Word, but in my feeble mind, I I often need help to get there. And so I read of others or read others who help me understand God's Word, and it's just been so, so helpful. But nothing compares to God's actual inspired Word, which has no error, no mistake, no deviation from truth. And the Psalms with perfection, teach us how to pray, how to talk to the Lord. They they have this raw sort of gut level honesty to them that we can read and go, oh yeah, I get that. I felt that. (laughs) Oh, I've I've noticed that fear. Might have been a different circumstance, might have been a a different situation for sure. But but yeah, that that rings true in, in my life. As we become more and more familiar with the particular wording Uh, the genres, uh, the patterns that are used in the Psalms, we begin to see how we can pray these very words, how we can cry them out. And actually, they help us learn how to do that with our own words, how to pattern our prayers after the prayers of the Psalms, how to, to, to maybe as an individual or with my family sit down and say, let's, let's learn to pray this together. As our family is struggling with this situation and this scenario, we don't know necessarily how to, how to go to the Lord. And so what we want to do in this series, Raw, the language of the Psalms, is learn how to re-engage with God through the language of the Psalms. We want to learn how to do so with, with confidence. We want to deepen, maybe, or maybe, maybe for the first time, you gain a passion for prayer. You become invigorated to talk to the Lord in prayer. Donald Whitney wrote a book on prayer, and it's called Praying Scripture or Praying the Bible. And and in it, he says, he talks about, uh, sometimes we get stuck in these rhythms. We say the same old things about the same old things. So it's no wonder that we don't pray. Well, the Psalms in particular can help us from saying the same old things about the same old things. The Bible, friends, is the most important book for all of us, and it is accessible to every one of us. And that's important. If you're a parent or a grandparent, you're watching this and you say, you know, uh, some of these wording, some of this wording in the Psalms, 
is hard for my kids to get. Well, that's okay, because I read some words in the Psalms that are hard for me to get. And that's good for us to say, you know, let's take this language, these phrasings, these words, let's bring them down into our everyday vernacular, but not just to stay there, but to really to draw us back into the Psalms. We've seen so far things like uh, the phrase, blessed is, maybe another way of saying happy in Jesus. Someone who is blessed on earth is someone who is happy or fulfilled or totally satisfied in Jesus. Because when we are totally satisfied in Jesus, we certainly will be blessed. We, we learn things like uh, confession is a way of saying, I'm sorry, Lord. Or to take it a step further, agreeing with God that what we've done is against His will for our lives and concluding with, I'm sorry. Help me to walk in faith. Lament, which many of us are praying right now are experiencing right now. Why, Lord? But, but it's not just a why, Lord, that finds its end there. It's, it's a why, Lord, that, that leads us to faith. A why, Lord, that leads us to confidence in the Lord and trust in Him. A petition, help me, Lord. I, I need your help. And actually, today we'll see several of these in this particular psalm we're looking at. And praise, Maybe, maybe the easiest one for us to understand, praise and thanksgiving. Praise is, I love you, Lord. You're wonderful, God. You're my God. And thanksgiving, which is, which is thank you for, and then fill in the blank. There are songs or, or psalms that are general psalms of thanksgiving, and then there, there are some that are more specific. Today, we'll see one that's more, more specific. And thanksgiving is what we see today in Psalm 118, where the psalmist says, thank you, Lord, for your forever faithful love. Thank you, God, that you are forever faithful to yourself. Now, that sounds a little selfish for us to say we're going to be faithful to ourselves. The difference between us and God is God's perfect. So it's actually the kindest thing that God can do to be faithful to himself, which is actually a kindness to us because we experience the benefits of a wonderful, kind, and gracious God because he is faithful to himself and to his promises and which are made to his people and are for his glory. Let's read together in Psalm 118. Verses 1 through 4. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, His steadfast love endures forever. Ever. Let the house of Aaron say, His steadfast love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, His steadfast love endures forever forever. Friends, you and I are to give thanks to God for His forever faithful love. Sometimes His forever faithful love doesn't seem as clear because the circumstance of our life blurs our vision. It's actually the sin in our heart that causes us to misinterpret the situations in our life or to misinterpret God's love for us as we look at trial and tragedy that's before us. Have you ever been in an area where there's been some form of of, of vapor from gas? And so you look and you look through that and everything is kind of murky and blurry and moving around on the other side of that. That is, sin affects our lives in that way. And we look at the circumstances around us and we begin to go, Lord, you don't look very clear over there. You don't look very faithful. You don't look very loving because I'm not feeling right at this moment. But we are called in faith to look to and thank God for his forever faithful love. This is a call to worship here at the beginning of this psalm. You see these first four verses. There's a a general call to worship. There's a call in verse 2 to everyone in the nation, all of the lay people in the nation. Then there's a call to the priests and the pastors in the nation. And then at the end, all who fear the Lord, remember that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You say, well, I want to be wise in this life. I want to handle these situations and these circumstances in a, in a wise manner. Well, then set your hope on the Lord. Look first to Him. And when we look to Him, 
We establish our plans, but, but the Lord makes our ways prosper according to his will. Sometimes you might look at a, a Bible passage, and I've read many, many Bible passages before, and I've, I've read it, and I've looked at it, and I've thought, I wonder what this means. This seems kind of perplexing. Or you read it, and you're like, what in the world is this verse talking about? Uh, that is not the case here. As we learn to give uh, praise to God for his forever faithful love, we see this call to worship, which says over and over again, his steadfast love endures forever. We see it in Psalm 110. We see it in other Psalms. We see it in several places in the Bible. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Now, why? Why do we give thanks to the Lord? Well, number one, because he is good at the end of verse one. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Would you just pause? I mean, we're barely into this thing yet, and it's just, it's just worth pausing to say, Lord, thank you that you, number one, are forever. You are eternal, and your love endures forever. Verse 5, for the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever. Are you seeing the theme here? God is good, and his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. We are seeing here that God's loyal love. God is one who is loyal, and, and he is the covenant-making and covenant-keeping God. He makes promises, and he keeps promises. Remember, he made a promise back to Abram, and he said, Abram, go. I'm going to send you to a land that I will tell you. He tells Abram to go before he even tells him where to go. He says, you pack up your stuff, get your family, and you go. I'll tell you where to go. I'll tell you when you're there. And I am going to multiply you. I'm going to make a nation out of you that you won't even be able to count. And Abram went. C could you imagine, as we're talking about, talking about the faithful love of God, could you imagine a conversation, say, between a husband and a wife? You probably know where I'm going. And, and they are exchanging their love for each other. Oh, I love you, honey. Oh, I love you too. And the wife says, why do you love me? Uh, I mean, that would be an awkward moment and a bad night for him. I'm just telling you, nothing else in the day is going to go well that day for that guy, right? I mean, if you tell the Lord or if you tell your wife or wives tell your husbands or, or parents to your kids, I'm setting you up now this afternoon. Dad, why do you love me? Mom, why do you love me? If we were to say, Lord, I love you. Or to the world, I love the Lord so much. And then have trouble filling in the whys. Boy, that kind of blank stare. Uh, we need to rehearse the whys. We need to rehearse the whys. I had a friend, uh, a friend who, who once talked about band rehearsals. And the idea of rehearsing is to rehear. We rehear what we're practicing so that we can hear what's right, hear what's wrong, and make adjustments to grow and become better skilled at whatever it is that we are uh, playing or performing or, or whatnot. So I want to ask you to think about specific ways that you have experienced God's forever faithful love. And the more we think on these specific ways, the more we think on the ways that God has shown his specific love to you, you'll have a song to sing. Even if you're not a singing person, you see, the Christian faith is a singing faith. There are songs all throughout the Bible. In fact, Psalms is largely a, a prayer book, a song prayer book. And the more you think on the specific ways that God has shown his love to you, we use the Bible to help us in that because the Bible categorizes us. It kind of hems us in on both sides. But we see in verses 5 through 18 that God's amazing power delivers and frees his people. Out of my distress, verse 5, I called on the Lord, the Lord answered me, and the Lord set me free. Do you see, there's a cause here. There's a cause for prayer and for praise. A cause for prayer and for praise. And I want to tell you, friends, the Lord uses distress to help us 
pray. Now pause for a minute. When we think about God's forever faithful love, when we think about the way someone loves us, we often think that they do things that I like. They do things that are pleasing to me, that are pleasant to me, that I like, that I appreciate, that I want more of. And while that is true, real love, biblical love, does not only give us that which immediately feels pleasant to us. Parents who love their children discipline their children. The father who loves his children, Hebrews tells us, disciplines us. That's one of the ways that we even know that we are a child of God. When we sin, we repent, and we experience God's loving discipline. And God uses tragedy and trial in our life to help us uh, go from being on our knees, looking at the ground, to learning to look up in prayer and say, Lord, I'm distressed. I need you. Lord, help me. Help me see. Give me wisdom, strength, energy, direction. You have it all. And you gladly give it all to those who, who ask from you. So there's a, there's a cause for prayer and praise. And there's, secondly, there's a, there's a lesson that the psalmist is learning here, that we have nothing to fear when the Lord is on our side. I was going to say when we are on the Lord's side, but the text said the Lord is on our side. So I'm going to go with the text. (laughs) The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look to him in triumph on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. We're in a season in our nation, in the world, experiencing this coronavirus pandemic. You might even be sick and tired of hearing the word coronavirus. If you are, consider yourself blessed because you're not feeling the effect of it as largely as those who are hearing it and who aren't maybe just sick of of hearing the, the word COVID-19 or the word coronavirus, but are actually dealing with the effect of it. Those who are sick, those who are living, who have had family members who have passed away or who are very ill with coronavirus. But let's extend it beyond coronavirus because there are many in our world, many friends and family and neighbors who are sick with other things. Cancer, MS, just to name a couple. And we're tempted in each and every situation, to put our trust in man, to put our trust in governments, to put our trust in solutions. Now, that doesn't mean we don't pray for solutions. It doesn't mean that we don't pray for our president. We are to pray for everyone who's in leadership, but we don't put our ultimate trust in them because what we we recognize is that if the Lord allows it, it is for his good Sovereign purposes. We remember that he's good. We remember who he is. We remember his character and his nature. And we recognize that when God is on our side, we have nothing to fear. We don't fear the coronavirus, though we, though we hate it. We hate it because it's part of the fall. It's part of the sin that affects the natural world that we live in and and, and everything in our world. Our lives are riddled with sin, and this is part of it. We don't have the answers for all of the whys, for, for coronavirus or AIDS or other pandemics that have hit the world in, in years past. But what we know is God never changes. His purposes are forever. And we who walk in faith can trust him. Now, we remember faith is not believing in what we can see, but, but, but believing in what we don't see and having a confident assurance of that. And that is the Lord. You know, uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul quoted this in, in Romans 8.31, or he referenced it anyway. He said, uh, what shall we say then to these things if God is for us? Who can be against us? Hebrews 13, the writer says, verse 6, So we confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Nothing 
of any eternal consequence is the rhetorical answer. And there's a testimony. So there's, there's, there's a cause. There's a lesson to be learned. And then there's a testimony to give. In the name of the Lord, we win. And I love that new song that came out uh, maybe a year ago called We Win, uh, Mercy Me. It's a great song. They said they wanted to write it in a way that was, was like a stadium song, just this great and this song where everybody kind of, yeah, we win. And it's that kind of a song. And, and, and we think that, or we need to remember that in the name of the Lord, we win. Listen to verse 10 through 13. All the nations surrounded me. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. So there's, there's an earthly thing to be done. In battle, there's, there's battle to be waged. There's war to be waged. There are, there, are, uh, there are solutions and procedures and wisdom and counsel. There is lots for us to do. But our ultimate victory is not in these things. Our ultimate victory is in the Lord. It's the Lord who brings victory, and it is the Lord who brings defeat. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. Verse 11, they surrounded me, surrounded me on every side. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of the Lord, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was failing. But the Lord helped me. In the name of the Lord, we win because the Lord is our helper. Are you discouraged? Are you frustrated with a situation or a circumstance that seems to be uh, all uh, coming up on you and you can't do anything about it? You have relationships and it seems like no matter what you say, the other person just won't hear your perspective. Trust me, they're probably thinking the same thing of you too. And so only time will tell how the Lord will grow you each through it. But in each situation, in each circumstance, we feel like we are, uh, have this onslaught of the circumstances of life, the enemies. We have a real true enemy whose name is Satan, and he wants to steal and kill and destroy. We don't know in the Psalms exactly which scenario uh, this is written about. We actually don't know the Psalm writer, which is why you might have noticed that when I read that, I, I didn't mention the writer. We don't know who wrote this Psalm. There are some educated guesses out there, but sometimes it's good to know not, not, not know the exact situation. Everyone's best educated guess that it's after the, the exile, but the Psalm applies to each of us. An Old Testament psalm quoted, many parts of this psalm quoted uh, 16, 19 times in the New Testament. They are surrounded on every side. They are clear enemies of the Lord. There were times when the Lord used ungodly nations to judge his national people. What would this be that judgment? Well, there were times when the Lord would surround his people and tell the commanders of the armies to whittle down their troops. And it made no sense. The Lord said, well, I'm going to win in such a way that you'll know it was me who won the battle. I'm going to control the direction of the arrow. So it strikes exactly on the mark that I need it to strike on to accomplish my purposes. In the name of the Lord, we win. And then there's a praise There's a cause, there's a lesson, there's a testimony, and there's a praise. Our praise is that we live specifically to proclaim God's purposes and victorious power. When you and I experience everything in life, it's not just for the sake of enduring it. It's not only for the sake of getting through it. It's so that in the battle, we declare God's praise. In the victory, we declare God's praise. In the temporary earthly defeat... We declare God's praise. I, you might be confused there because I said my last point was in the Lord we win. But ultimately that's an eternal victory because Christians don't win every earthly battle. In fact, it feels like we lose many. 
Listen to verses 14 through 18 as this praise is uttered. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord exalts. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I shall not die, but I shall live and I will recount the deeds of the Lord. The Lord has disciplined me severely, but he has not given me over to death. Do you remember what he says there in verse 17? I shall not die, but shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. Let me ask you, friend, what have you endured in life that has in the moment been terrible, in the moment sought to to tear you down to where you felt like uh, there was nothing you could do to escape from the trial, the pain, the encouragement, I mean the encouragement, the, the, uh, the effect of of relational struggle, and you thought, there's no way I can come back from this. And by God's grace and in His timing, He allows you to come back, and it is for the purposes of recounting the deeds of the Lord. It's not simply to bring us victory so that we can say we had victory, so that we can say, I fight to live another day. I mean, I live to fight another day. We have victory And we endure hardship, which is victory in the Lord's eyes, so that we can recount his deeds. I want you to listen to what the Apostle Paul quotes in 2 Corinthians 6. He says, We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, by great endurance, in afflictions, in hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, by knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy uh, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God with weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left through honor and dishonor, slander and praise. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown, but yet well-known, as dying, and behold, we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing everything. We've spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is I love this phrase. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you're restricted in your own affections. And in turn, I speak as to children. Widen your hearts also. When we live and we speak and we engage with others, you're going to go through a lot. You're going to endure a lot of pain. There was a, a long season of my life, and I would dare say it would be over. I really wanted everything to be easy. I really thought that if I loved God, everything should be easy. I mean, I would be the first to stand in line and say, I don't, I don't believe the prosperity gospel, which preaches that and, and far more garbage. But I, 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 I thought that my life should be simple. I thought my life should be without pain because I love God, as though I was the special one. But God is the righteous one. God is the holy one. And so we live in whatever circumstance he brings our way, that he allows to come our way. And through it, we trust him, knowing that he brings the battle, he brings the victory, he helps us look to him in prayer, and he gives us a testimony of praise. And friends, you, when you learn to, to love the testimony of praise post-hardship or in the midst of hardship, you learn a new joy, a new way to declare the Lord's praise. Point three here, every earthly victory brings hope and expectation and causes us to look to eternal victory as we sort of fly through the last half of this psalm. 
Only God's salvation makes us righteous. Listen in verses 118, I mean, Psalm 118, verses 19 and 21. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. And I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. Now, as the Jews in that day would be journeying to Jerusalem, making their journey, journey, they would come to the gates and they would need to check their hearts. You know, you've heard the phrase, check yourself before you wreck yourself. They, they would have to check their hearts and, and see what they needed to do to, to earth, in an, from an earthly standpoint, purify themselves before they would enter in. They had to check their heart. But I want you to hear how Jesus reinterprets this idea in John chapter 10. It's no longer about an earthly tabernacle, but Jesus said, again, I say to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. And all who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go on and will go, I'm sorry, and will go in and will find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd and the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Friend, when you are tempted to question God's forever faithful love, the scriptures bring the greatest comfort as you look back through them to see how God has worked in the lives of his people down through the ages. And you come to the New Testament as we come to Holy Week this week and we celebrate this Holy Week. You know, it's a celebration because we know the end of the story, but it's a celebration that we go into almost like with a pit in our stomach. You know, I see these uh, palm branches before me. Thank you, Tony, for purchasing these for us as a church. We don't have anybody here to really give them out to, so Julia uh, used them and kind of made this display for us here this morning. But it's a reminder that as Jesus was coming in uh, to Jerusalem that holy week, there were palm branches that were sewn together to make a path for him. And the people would say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which comes from this psalm that we'll see in a minute. But you know, They thought he was coming to to do business with Rome in an earthly sense. Jesus was coming to, to do business with the Lord of those ungodly Romans, Satan. Jesus came to do eternal spiritual business because he has a forever faithful love. Because he is the good shepherd who is now going to demonstrate that forever faithful love as he lays down his life for his sheep. The stone, verse 22, that the builders rejected, well, it's become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Oh, oh wait. Jesus is entering Jerusalem. Jesus is ready to be beaten, and he is ready to be flogged, and he is ready to be killed for your sin and for mine. And looking forward to that, as we reinterpret this text based on the New Testament, Jesus is the chief cornerstone. And borrowing from this text, we say, how is it marvelous in God's eyes? Verse 24, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. 1 Peter 2, 4 talks to believers and he says, as you come to him, meaning Jesus, a a living stone rejected by men and in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house. So he changes the metaphor here a bit. Oh, no, no, he doesn't. I'm sorry. I was confusing two different things. But to be a holy priesthood, to, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus, for it stands in Scripture. And here's where we see different parts of this psalm quoted. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Friend, if you want to experience God's forever faithful love, you must believe in the one he sent, who is the cornerstone that some reject and will be ashamed. But those who accept and and turn to and walk in and build the foundation of your life upon in faith will not be crushed and destroyed. So there is honor for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, 
Well, the stone that the builders reject has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you may proclaim. Did you hear that phrase? That you may proclaim the testimony of God. You are, you are saved. You are given victory. You are made to endure great trial with joy that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and in to marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Brothers and sisters, we are blessed. We are happy in Jesus because God has given us his grace in salvation. Listen to the closing of this psalm. Save us, O Lord, we pray. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords and up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, and I will extol you. This great doxology at the end of Psalm 118. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. God is a forever faithful God because he's the only forever one. God loves you. God loves me with a love that is near impossible, dare I say impossible, for us to comprehend. Without his illuminating work in our heart, shining a light on the truth of the word of God, on the reality of the condition of our hearts, and on the extraordinary sacrifice of his son, Jesus. And many in this world and in these times would die, but only one, only one who's perfect would die for the many who are imperfect. That's what we get to celebrate next week is the, the impact, the effect of God's great love in Christ poured out in Jesus as the wrath of God's judgment towards sin is poured out on Christ for you, for me. What are the, <laughs> what are the specific ways that you have experienced God's forever faithful love? How can you recount them? What, are, what has been the cause that has lifted your gaze to the Lord? What have you learned from it in that lesson? And what testimony has come out of it that you can share? I encourage you this week as we continue to learn the language of the Psalms, to take your family, to take your children and, and read a Psalm, read this Psalm, read another Psalm and, and begin to to see that there's a language there that is intended for us to go to the Lord with, to praise Him with, to teach one another with as we engage the Lord in prayer. Friend, the relationship with God, the active engagement of our relationship with Him, that's the real joy of following this forever faithful God. Father, I thank you for this incredible word that you've given us. Thank you that you have done everything necessary that we would be able to come to you in prayer. You, you gave your son so that no longer do we need to go and, and get to the gate of Jerusalem, to, to, to the gate of the tabernacle and, and stop. But no, we rush headlong to the Father because of all that you have done for us, Jesus. The veil of the temple torn in two from top to bottom. And full entrance to the presence of God offered for everyone who comes in the name of Jesus. Because in the name of Jesus, well, we've been given victory. Thank you. Help us to grow day by day in understanding your forever faithfulness. That you would be praised and glorified in all things. In Jesus' name, amen.